Yeah. <laughs> You're listening to Autodesk's Digital Builder Podcast, a show that inspires construction professionals to innovate and use technology to improve how they build our world. I'm Eric Thomas, and I've been working in construction for nearly a decade. And now I have the privilege to sit down with industry trailblazers to hear how they're solving construction's biggest challenges and redefining the future of the built environment. Welcome to another episode of Autodesk's Digital Builder Podcast. I am your host, Eric Thomas, and we are sitting down in the Autodesk Gallery in San Francisco, and I am joined by Andrew Cameron, the project manager with Hensel Phelps. Andrew, how are you feeling today? Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you so much for hosting. Great space. Happy to be here and talk about technology and innovation. Yeah, and this is going to be a good lead on to the last time that we chatted. It was we we should have recorded that conversation because it could have been its own podcast in in its own merit. But we're going to have some cool uh, time to to dig into some robotics and some other neat technologies. But first and foremost. I know you've worked closely with several construction technology companies, which I'm thankful for as somebody who's worked for a couple different yeah. technology companies, including startups. Could you tell me about your role in those, those relationships with those organizations? Yeah, great question. Um, so for me, I kind of have this like unique perspective where, again, I'm a customer first. So again, as a project manager with Hensel Phelps, again, tasked with making sure that our team, my team, the project you know, has the right tools. Um, but as of late, I've also started to, you know, grow or celebrate more of that, you know, pilots or, you know, customer liaison um, or even more of like a coach and just really helping, you know, both teams, again, our project team who's, you know, taking on the new technology, but also the software team that's, you know, trying to develop and make our lives easier, uh, understand again what each party is trying to do. And yeah. Certainly recently have had the good fortune of working with some really talented uh, startup companies where, again, they're bringing awesome new innovative approaches um, and also the great fortune of working with some really strong people um, within Hensel Phelps that are willing to kind of adapt and uh, go through those growing pains. Yeah, and there's there's something to be said about having the willingness to try something too, because bringing change, especially into a, an organization in construction or just our in industry at large, there's not a lot of margin for, you know, trial and error at times because the schedules have such rigidity and there's there's so little time at, at some instances to make changes or find those ways. And so giving your teams the the space to do that has such an ROI, both for your own company and then as somebody like when I worked at Plan Grid still before the acquisition. It was so appreciated by our staff where, you know, I, I, of course, work in construction, but we have people come in and help a sanity check and bring the tech people who really understand what's possible with technology and align that what's actually meaningful to the construction industry, because those are two very different things. Yeah, that's a great point. And I can definitely appreciate, you know, both sides because uh, in construction, again, most sites are dynamic. You know, what we do is different. You know, the buildings change. But at the core, that like process, you know, that can be repeated. And, you know, when you're a startup and you're trying to get, you know, the new, you know, big sales account um, or roll out that next great feature, it can be tempting to pivot hard left, you know, make something that's super niche for like, you know, this, you know, whether it's an airport or like this big mega job. But then, you know, how do we deploy that and scale that on more common or, you know, like, you know, cyclical projects? Um, yeah, there's, there's so much to balance there. And there's one thing that I've seen where like construction companies are starting to become technology companies in their own right. And finding ways to partner with outside companies like, like Autodesk or other ones, there's a lot of value there because I've, I've seen organizations build their own t internal tools and they put a lot of resourcing into it and develop something out. And then the, the platform that you've adopted releases something you've spent a year creating is a new feature set. And they have more resources to actually develop that than your own organization. And so if you can build those relationships and help guide those choices with the technology that's being developed, everybody in the big picture wins. And it's, it's, but it's a nuanced balance, as, you, as you're kind of alluding to a moment ago. So I appreciate your, your role in that uh, conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. It is kind of a challenge where 
you know, especially if you're a really savvy customer and you see an obvious pain point. It's like, we just need to do these three things to solve it. It can be tempting to absolutely your point. Let's just go build it, you know, fix it, you know, pull the nail out. Um, but you're absolutely right. If you take more of that sustainable approach and view, you know, there are software solutions that probably should mature externally uh, versus, you know, need to get built and generated, you know, internally. Yeah. And it's, it's more of a, an allocation of resources and thinking that long term big picture, as you mentioned. So there's there's a lot to be said there. But if we take a step back and, and just look at piloting new hardware or software on your projects and how do you ensure that either your company or the clients that you work for are really getting value out of those efforts? Yeah, I would say I guess like first and foremost, you know, like pilots can be messy. Yeah. And, you know, I think there's some stigma, like, you know, especially when you read a lot of these case studies that, you know, it's all about the success. And, you know, as a customer, when you read that and you go through a bad pilot, that can be discouraging. It's like, well, you know, what am I doing wrong? You know, this is just not for me. I'm not big enough. You know, I'm not agile enough. I truly try to first understand what the founder and the company is trying to do. You know, what is that core problem or like guiding vision that's getting them excited every day? Um, and truly, again, just try to understand that like base level because they may not have the correct vernacular to speak about our pain point. But if they have a software solution or a hardware solution that is really mature or is, you know, getting the right resources, then all of a sudden we can start to try to translate that and be like, well, while this is really good at that and what you're maybe looking at over here is, you know, accurate, have you ever thought of or tried deploying it here where it may be like an easier, you know, path to pilot? Um, and then the other thing, too, is really understanding our project team's needs. Because um, while construction might be, you know, long, we'll call it, you know, two years, um, finding that right window, so to speak, about, you know, when to integrate can be tough. Yeah. And... Again, if the you know starting company, you know the startup doesn't really appreciate our constraints, and if we fully don't understand um, and are in a line with what they're good at, that's when it starts to break down. But if both companies can truly come together and have that like you know true symbiotic relationship, you know, then it's really exciting because what you're really piloting is their interpretation of the industry and how they think that you can kind of like tweak and you know manipulate you know the workflow that again, ultimately will be using. Yeah. And it's workflows that have existed for, you know, a hundred years or more sometimes. And so it's, it's a, it's a nuanced dance and you, you kind of hit the nail on the head from what I've seen in my experience is if you forget about un addressing both the construction company's needs, but also the needs of the clients that they're serving, and you don't think about those as you develop those new pieces of technology, it's easy to miss simply because people are going to be resistant to that change, especially if the change you're trying to implement is something that will not work with those processes. Yeah. And processes can change, but it's not something that you can just rip and replace and say suddenly you go, we're building a whole new building in a completely new way now. <laughs> it's it's an iterative journey. And uh, I think that the companies that understand that and really step back and say, why haven't purpose-built tools like this existed for construction for a long time. If you don't unpack that mystery a little bit, it's easy to just kind of step to the finish line and go, okay, we've got a new thing for you. And everybody goes, yeah, the new thing is neat, but also it won't work with any of the requirements we have with our agency that we have to work <laughs> yeah. for today. So. so true. And the other thing too, you know, especially with those, you know, workflows, especially, you know, software, is that sometimes we're like, maybe like for the first three months, call it, you know, the workflows will truly be run in parallel, you know, legacy and new. And again, if you're not aligning expectations from the beginning, you know, it could be very easy for a client um, or even another stakeholder to be like, why are you doing that? I thought we're piloting something. Um, but again, it's just to kind of give that good you know, base level to make sure that, again, everything that should be happening is happening. So you don't have to, to your point, go all the way back and recreate it. It's just, again, is this better? Is this faster? Is this more reliable, more predictable? And start to really identify, you know, what metrics, business metrics do we want to try to hone in on? In, in the pilot part of that conversation for me has always seemed to resonate is wh whether it's just making process changes absent of technology or bringing stuff in that's completely new. Every time I talk to customers who are overwhelmed by adopting more formal data strategies or new technologies or something, it's very easy for them to look very big picture at the beginning 
And you really have to narrow that focus and either pick one specific thing you're trying to iterate on or at the same time, at least one one project, one area, one scope of work. Because if you, you have that pie in the sky, full vision, it's a good one, but it's very easy to get overwhelmed and set yourself up for failure if you're not really f- just focusing. Like you, focus, focus, focus. That's the, that's yeah. the name of the game. Well, like we were talking about in that leadoff conversation, you know, you can get caught up with trying to you know boil the ocean, and there's just so much in front of you. But you know, like you know, as it kind of came out in you know discussion. Really, what we're looking for is just these small opportunity gains, you know, getting, you know, a half a percent or a percent better. And like we mentioned, you know, speed is a byproduct of all that focus. And, you know, like for us, you know, one easy, you know, solution or pain point we had was, you know, just streamlining TNM tags. Um, again, they're coming in on carbon copy forms. It's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, I don't remember the last time I saw a carbon copy form. <laughs> exactly. But you like ask yourself, it's like, why are we doing this? And it's yeah. like, you know, oftentimes it's because we did it before. Yep. And it's like, okay, well, could we do it differently? And again, as people start to see pilots become more successful, um, the answer starts to become more like, yeah, we should try that or let's, you know, engage something else. And I'm, I'm interested to hear, do you have any specific guidance for those would-be founders or people who are really excited about con- construction technology and either have an idea or a passion to help them create those tools that really do meet the needs of the construction industry? Like, where, where would you say they should have their heads when they're, when they're starting from day one and, and building something new? Yeah, I can probably appreciate, you know, like day one, it's almost, you know, like maybe like, you know, 70-30. You know, 70 is certainly on like the tech, the IP, you know, where it's going forward. But you do want to have like at least a pulse on the industry. And, you know, construction's interesting. I'm sure like you can appreciate, you know, selling tech into it. Um, you know, it's a lot of relationship based. Yeah. Uh, like you said, it's definitely on you know, trust. Um, and again, contracting's hard. You know, these contracts that we're signed up to are very onerous. We have a very prescript thing we need to deliver at a very like, you know, set time and budget. So when we take on new innovation, Again, we're taking on more risk because we still have to deliver. And I would say the founders that do it well, you know, either have someone in their team that can speak, you know, both languages, almost like an ambassador or a liaison, um, or at least someone, you know, in their circle that can at least bring in some outside, you know, thought, but inside to the industry to kind of say, like, you know, you know, prompt the question, have you considered? Yeah. Um, and for us, you know, those conversations can happen over coffee, can happen just walking the job site. Um, but at a minimum, just show that you're there. You're present. I'm thinking about doing this. You know, am I missing anything? And it's, it's a difficult industry to understand in depth from the outside. And it's one of the things that I'm thankful for in, in the seat I have today because I've walked job sites. My, my peers were project managers, project executives. You know, we're putting proposals together. And I would say that I, I'm a tourist on a project set at times because I, I am not a project manager, but I would never represent myself as one. But I understand the, the challenges the industry is having. And I've talked to these people and I've helped them put what they're struggling with into words if it's, you know, putting betterments into a proposal or, or something along those lines. And it's, it's something that makes it easier for me to have a conversation like the one that we're having right now. And I think that applies to any construction technology companies. You need to find those people who have a passion for the tech and, and make sure they're in the room, whether they're on staff for you or you have the advisors to come in and, and have those conversations. And it's something that Autodesk is doing quite well right now. And I, I won't go on at length about it, but like our customer success team values those relationships and they want to have that feedback and they want to hear because they take that information and that goes directly to our product teams because we want to iterate. It's not, it's not that we're hesitant to make change or anything. We want to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the industry. And the best way to do that is to talk directly to our customers. So true. And again, it goes back to what we said earlier where you, know, you have to have that alignment. And again, as a customer, I can fully appreciate that if I'm saying I want a feature added, you know, whether it's changing, you know, UI or UX, you know, whatever it is, adding a field, you know, allowing more characters, I need to be able to explain that in, you know, a, a holistic term that, to your point, product can know how to go implement that in the next sprint cycle. So it's not this one-off Hensel Phelps field. 
it can be more of a sustained software like attribute yeah. you know, that everyone can actually benefit from. And that's a big one too of, of having flexibility within this technology too because while the processes are very similar from company to company, they aren't exactly the same. And if, if that tool doesn't flex to some degree to accommodate that, you're going to have a challenge. And I've seen some where they charge you to make custom, custom forms and all kinds of other nonsense, which just seems outrageous because it's it's like you're being directly competitive, competitive to your customer because you're always going to need that flexibility. You're always going to be able to make sure that you fit the process for your owner, your agency, or you know whatever you're working for. But building on that, there is a lot of technology out there in the construction industry right now. I think the, the venture capitalists have realized, oh gosh, this is a place to innovate, which we're very fortunate for, but it creates a lot of noise. And so I'm interested, what do you consider to be truly innovative right now in what is such a noisy and, and kind of cluttered ecosystem of, of new tools and tech and you know options to consider from? Yeah, I think for me, what I'm really excited for to start either you know, gaining more ground, more traction or attention um, is kind of like twofold. You know, one is certainly, you know, hopefully this, you know, optimism that augmented reality, you know, AR on the job site will become easier. You know, it's not going to have to have specialized hardware like a HoloLens to deploy. You can use an iPhone 14 that has really good onboard hardware. The other one that's interesting in the space that I think is going to deploy, and I'm not sure exactly how to draw the parallels, um, is you're seeing some more software solutions uh, being steered earlier in the life cycle of construction, mm -hmm. um, especially as we have a lot of progressive contracts, you know, design build, IPD, um, you know, lean construction. We are now starting to see software solutions get stand up and address those unique workflows. So I think for me, it's not necessarily like what's jumping out at me in this space, but more of like a you know, wishful, like, you know, Christmas list uh, type customer saying where I want to see growth, you know, adoption um, and more deployment would be in AR and again, that early pre-construction uh, software guidance. And I think that spot that you're, you're kind of leaning in on right now is where the opportunity lies in reducing waste in meeting some of these more aggressive schedules and also offering more flexibility as materials are uncertain. We have so many weird things happening in the world right now that can be very surprising with lead times on materials and sourcing and all this other stuff. And the more we're able to implement technology-based workflows and more collaborative ways of starting a project, I agree completely. Like, that's where the future is headed. And IPD can sound scary for somebody who hasn't, you know, stepped uh, step foot on a project like that because it feels weird to be so transparent about some of these things when you've been beholden to very adversarial contracts before where you, you weren't going to be transparent because it puts you at risk. But now the risk is shared and the yep. incentive is shared. And so I think the technology piece is really where we were kind of behind the curve before and now it's, it, I think it's changing and I'm, I'm excited about it too. Yeah, you're, you are seeing exactly to that point, Eric. Um, you know, software that was built for more of that legacy, you know, contracting means, yeah. you know, like, you know, like an Oracle type database. Um, but yeah, now it's way more distributed or needs to be. So you can find the best, like, you know, thought leader, subject matter expert to solve or guide whatever you're looking at. And if the software can't be agile and, you know, keep up with all those different meetings, um, you know, iterations, trends, whatever you want to call them, then again, you're trying to, you know, push something into like, you know, a pegboard just for the sake of doing it. And that's where, again, AR, you know, for us is really exciting because obviously it can help on, you know, safety and cost, but it can also, you know, again, optimistically be able to get all of that kind of key core information that all those smart people in the rooms, you know, discovered or determined and more easily get that into the hands of the journeyman, the trades, the craft that actually need to go build this thing. It makes sense that you're, you're eliminating the barriers in that information, you know, distribution and you're, you're eliminating some of that in a way that I don't think historically it's always been intentional to gatekeep information. But part of it was we were just beholden to outdated systems or non user friendly yep. systems that weren't made for the thing. So you could either have, you know, Sam over in, you know, estimating who holds on to his documents for dear life because it gives him a position of importance in the project where you go, you got to talk to Sam to get that information. Or Sam could have just put it on a shared drive and then forgot about it because he's not worried about it. 
and other people to discover that it's it's an onerous project. So like there's there's a lot to be said about purpose built and you know common data environments and being a bit more transparent in that information, not just within the GC but with all the trades that you're working for and with as well. So true. And the other realization that you know, I think a lot of savvy customers are finding is as soon as you print, you know, to your point, that RFI, that bulletin, that's static and that's now divorced from yeah. all of that center of excellence and knowledge because it's a static piece of paper. So if we were to change one thing, enhance one thing, tweak, whatever you want to call it, the person that's holding that, you know, that trades individual, they don't know. And now you have to try to track down that piece of paper and like, you know, you know, correct it, you know, stop it, update it. Where again, if everything can live more, you know, digitally, you know, collectively together, it just prevents someone from having to waste their time, effort, like you said, for all those reasons in the uh, market right now. Yeah, and it was. I, I, I can think back to my proposal management days where we had a hard bid due at 11 a.m. and 11:01 is it's not accepted anymore because it's considered late. And 15 minutes before it's due, our estimating team has finally gotten all the documents from our subcontractors because they don't want to share early because they don't want you to shop your bids around, which I understand. I have empathy there. It's, it's, an, it's an awkward and nuanced stance. But then the estimating team is frantically trying to make sure that everything is in the pr format that I need. Shoot me Excel documents. I'm trying to export it to PDFs. I'm trying to cram it in the <laughs> format that we're doing. God forbid the power of the internet goes out. Or back when I was still a federal contractor, print out 15 copies and shove them in a box and go, FedEx man, please stop driving away. I have this very important thing for you. And as we've, we've gotten more in the realm of technology that supports those workflows, which didn't exist when I was still doing, you know, proposal management specifically. Yeah. It, it benefits everybody too. And you're going to have better bids. You're, you're not going to have this, oh gosh, two weeks later, there's a gap in our bid because somebody didn't put this in and we went with the 70K number and somebody else was 200. And surprise, it should have been 200, but we didn't know because we had eight minutes to look at it. You know, it's, exactly. it's, it's chaos. Yeah, you're incentivizing the wrong thing. Um, and I do appreciate that the industry is moving forward in that you know, more progressive, you know, like let's find the right solution, yeah. not, you know, the cheapest solution. Uh, yeah, it definitely makes everyone's job a lot easier. I'm getting anxious just thinking about it now. It's it's <laughs> yeah, a life it's I haven't flashbacks. had to live in a long yeah. time. It's like RFP was a swear word for a while in uh, <laughs> in my house, but you know we're getting away from it. And the the other thing that I wanted to kind of bring back, and, and you and I talked about robotics pretty extensively when we first uh, had a conversation, and it's something that's top of mind for a lot of people in the industry for a variety of different reasons. And I wanted to learn a little bit more from the experience you've had at Hensel Phelps. And so I know you're using robots on very large projects right now. And so could you give me a high level overview of the scale that you're deploying robotics out on site? Yeah, and I think one thing that's you know, important to know is you know, the reason we're targeting some of the larger projects is to give our project teams and the, you know, the hardware team, like you know, the robotic company, just more time, more runway, so to speak. Um, because again, larger projects tend to be longer, there's more staff, there's more flexibility, and you don't have that Goldilocks, you know, like two week or two month period Maybe that turns into a year or a year and a half. And you know, the real kind of like areas that we wanted to try to focus on last year um, after the pandemic were, again, automated or semi-automated uh, reality capture, again, partnering with Hollow Builder and Boston Dynamics, uh, using you know, robotic layout tools mm -hmm. uh, to, again, help increase the fidelity of the federated model um, out to the field. Uh, so had a really, you know, a few good uh, pilots with Dusty, uh, Tessa and her team. And then also working with, you know, Canvas, you know, here locally as well, uh, starting to help preview what the future of the trade could look like, uh, both in terms of, you know, the tools on set, but also more importantly, the skills and the training that go into the craft force, again, to make them successful. It's yeah. not just about, you know, brute force anymore. There is some finesse. And now really, thankfully, uh, some higher ed technology that they can start to learn and deploy. Yeah, it feels like there's a, a scale that we're, we're getting to a point where we can deploy this technology at now. And there is always some hesitation of, oh, this is going to come and, and take my job. But, you know, augmented reality, I just love, love the term augmentation in general when we talk about this type of technology because now if, if you're short-staffed, you can augment your team with some robotics. And so the expectation isn't we're replacing you. Now it's we can do more with less staff. We can save people's health as far as safety goes. There's always, at least at this point in the tech, from what I understand, going to be a fit and finish that a person still has to come in and, you know, oversight and check and make sure everything's good. But 
we're going to be struggling with labor challenges for a while. That's that's not an issue that goes away. And so anything we can do to, to help support that and keep our team safe and keep people, you know, feeling good for the rest of their career because they're not carrying giant uh, pieces of sheetrock around, I, I consider to be a win. Oh, absolutely. And especially if, uh, something like drywall finishing where, again, I mean, let's call it like, you know, let's say 75 percent, you know, the wall is pretty standard. Uh, but then you do have those inside corners, outside corners, soffits, you know, these really high end detail areas where, you know, let, you know, that trade individual do that area, you know, finish it, support it um, to a higher level of, you know, like excellence. Yeah. Because now they're not bogged down with having to finish just like a straight flat wall. You know, let the robot do the monotonous mundane task and allow these, you know, um, you know, individuals like you know the trades to really celebrate what they're good at. And leave behind like, you know, a consistent product and in some cases a better product because to your point, you know, they're not as tired, they're not as strained, um, and they're not as overworked. And there's a beauty in the talent that these tradespeople have as well. It's 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 astonishing. So as I look at on a very small scale, of course, like renovations in my home, there's some work that I won't even try to do myself. Like I'm not gonna lay beautiful tile, no matter how many YouTube videos I watch and how many books I read and how many times I break it and start over and go again, it is not going to look good. And I know that. And so being able to bring people in to do that beautiful part of the work, I think is huge because, and I love your example there too. They're not so tired. They're not doing that monotonous part. They're going to come in and go, I'm okay. We've got our, our base level stuff set up. Maybe I can do part of that or whatever. Probably not, but maybe, yeah. you know, and then they're going to come in there and make it beautiful. And they're going to really showcase just this incredible talent that they have. And I, I hope we can cultivate more of that, too, because I feel like that part of the work is just more exciting for people, too. It's more interesting. And it, you know, it makes you think a bit more. Absolutely. The aspirational side of, you know, like robotics for the trade, you know, as you are talking to individuals in high school and coming up through the craft, you know, when you first start off and like, you know, the entry level job, it's like, OK, just, you know, push a broom or like, you know, you know, lump the material around. Yeah. And it's like, well, that's not glamorous. That's not really enticing people to like come work for your crew. But if some of that can be automated and now, you know, some of that, you know, early time onboarding is spent appreciating like, you know, the trap of you know, the craft bestowing, you know, that skill set and that talent to the next generation where, again, they can actually benefit from the one to one, um, you know, opportunities out there. Yeah. That all of a sudden makes the job seem way more appealing. Absolutely. And the perception issues we have in construction are, are challenging just because attracting people in is, is difficult. And I think the other aspect of that is you're talking about the, the artisan part of it. The counterpart is come look at this really interesting technology that you're going to get to work with as yep. well. I mean, I would love to work with robots every day. I think it's really neat. I, I want to do more site walks. I haven't been on site lately and I need to get back out and walk around and, and see some of the new things that are being done right now. And that's exciting and interesting. And it's not like you're out there like playing with toys or whatever. There, there's a value, but it is, it's still really neat. Like it's why I like having these conversations because I'm a giant nerd. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it certainly is fascinating to see, again, the willingness of the trades to welcome in, again, these you know, like young kids out of Silicon Valley that said, can I help you with your job? Yeah. And before that might have been met with a lot of resistance, but now absolutely. You know, you see a lot of different individuals walking the site and yeah, there's just like the new energy around it, which, um, you know, thankfully, like to your point, the VCs are recognizing, um, you know, the hardware companies are and just getting some of this other talent in because, yeah, I could never have imagined 10 years ago that, you know, a cement mason would also have a side skill set in computer science to again <laughs> run and finish a drywall partition. Uh, down there for us at the project. Yeah, it's, and we're no longer in the realm of the VDC company is the only tech-focused portion of the organization, too. And, and the good organizations are empowering that curiosity, and they're allowing people to build those skill sets. So it's not just, hey, I know you do VDC and you understand tech. Can you come help me with this thing? It's how can we help train everybody to have enough understanding of the different technologies to see where the value is, and then also you know, troubleshoot or deploy your work on some of it themselves as well. It's, it's empowering at a, a very large scale. Great point. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about the value and ROI that you're seeing coming from deploying robotics on sites. And were your teams or clients skeptical about that value as you started promising some of these technologies? Or were they committed and confident from the start where they go, yeah, that makes sense. Let's do it. I wouldn't say they were 100% uh, committed. <laughs> uh, there's definitely some handholding needed. Um, but again, going back, you know, we're really fortunate, again, within Hensel Phelps, to have some of the best people. 
And you know, I've worked for, work with, and work around some really collaborative and innovative individuals that are willing to answer that question, why not? Um, or at least ask it. And you know, for the instance of you know, Dusty Robotics rolling that out uh, down on the project in Sunnyvale, um, again, we partnered with our dry, uh, drywall partner um, or trade partner, NGI, Neville Group. And we had a lot of early onboarding conversations with you know, Dusty, NGI, and us saying this is, again, what we're trying to do. You know, Dusty, you know, Tess and your team, what are you capable of doing well? You know, NGI, what are you skeptical of? Um, and I think once we finally were able to deploy it and have everyone um, mobilized to the job site, uh, there was that alignment. And so much so that actually after the first couple of passes, uh, the foreman, um, not just for NGI, but for our mechanical and electrical company, it was kind of prompting the conversation of why didn't we print more? Yeah. You know, why couldn't we include this other information? And uh, quickly it turned from, you know, why are we doing this to, oh man, like, can we keep adding on? So level two was kind of pretty basic. Level three was a little more. Level four had uh, definitely a lot more. And again, all the while we were tracking it because we also wanted to prove to ourselves that there was value. Yeah. And certainly it was more expensive um, to, again, use a robotic system versus just, you know, you and I out there with the tape measure and chalk line. But what we found is that, you know, judging the performance on square foot alone wasn't fair. Because in certain areas, you may have no walls. In some areas, like a restroom, you might have more. So we started to uh, track everything by linear foot of partition. And again, while it was more expensive to use a robotic system, it was actually more productive. I think we got um, our peak was three times more linear footage laid out or I guess printed yeah. um, on site than a you know, traditional um, you know, two-person crew could do. That's incredible. So when you look at what you need to print, your constraints and everything like that, while there is more higher end upfront sunk cost, what you're able to do and more importantly turn over and release to the other trades that are again waiting on like, hey, Eric, where are we installing this thing? When you can release more the following day mm -hmm. um, with confidence and more accuracy, it quickly, it quickly showed everyone that, yes, this is the right problem to be focusing on. It makes sense. And as you're deploying that tech, too, there's a, there's a longer vision that's part of that conversation, too. So as you alluded to, the, the cost up front of buying the technology to go do the thing, that might be higher for your organization and, and cut a little bit into your profit, margin, argent, profit margins on that first project. But you still have those robots at the end of the day. So yep. you go to the you go to the next project and you start spreading that cost out a little bit. And if you're seeing that huge increase in actual productivity, that has a big value down down the line. So that it makes sense. And I think you're you're approaching that pilot in the right way where you're not over indexing, you're not going all in because you gotta you gotta get people confident about it. You gotta prove to yourselves, both your customers and your own organization and your people too. Yeah. And I think the people part is also a big one because Communicating why and how and the reasons has such a big impact because people, they're not going to be as resistant. They're not going to be as concerned about this, especially if they've not been looped into the benefits or the ROI or the fact that they're not about to lose their job because we have these new tools out on site, yep. which does lead into my next question, actually. Are there any myths tied to our, you know, robot overlords at this point now that you'd like a chance to, to, you know, do away with or bust? I know many people are worried about the the tools taking away their jobs, and I, I think we're starting to get better about qualifying that that's not the case. It's the augmentation conversation, but especially with those ongoing labor challenges, I, I think it's misguided. But is there, is there anything that you just like to say? No, this is actually not accurate, and you hear it, you know, all the time when the topic comes up. Well, it's certainly the way you know Canvas approached it. I think one of the second conversations they had in you know, their genesis was with the trade saying, we are trying to develop this for you. Um, and I think that approach of you know, for you know, the trades um, instead of you know, against mm -hmm. is a really good you know, like early alignment uh, that most companies are taking. Uh, but yeah, certainly you know, when everyone's like, oh God, yeah, you know, this common stereotype, you know, robots are here. You know, they're taking my job or sometimes also just all flash, you know, oh, here's the robot. Where's the marketing team? Yeah. You know, they're obviously trying to like, you know, <laughs> record something or promote something. Um, but again, when we started to roll these things out, you know, again, it wasn't just, you know, the project managers, the project executives that were getting excited. It was the journeyman. It was like the foreman. It was, you know, the trade that was 
waiting to install whatever the widget was that now had way more accuracy um, and information that they were ever afforded based on just a chalk line. Yeah. Like before, it's like, hey, can you label that? And now, with again, with Dusty, not only did they know what door frame number it was, they knew where the hinge was supposed to be just based on simple line weight, again, that already existed in the federated model. So I think once they finally started to use it and be around it, they wanted this on their next job because they didn't have to remember everything or they didn't have that you know, apprehension of like, oh, if I install this wrong, it's my fault. Because now, again, there's, there's less of a worry of that. Yeah. You know, yeah. The instructions are right there. You know, column kind of like color by number, you know, just follow along. And, you know, again, with Canvas, uh, seeing that it still required human support and was providing, you know, their younger generation a new skill or talent that they mm -hmm. could appreciate and really, like, you know, champion, you got the sense that they felt empowered. And to see that excitement in the crew, uh, to see the passion, that ownership, I think that, you know, was able to dispel a lot of myths of, you know, why are we doing this, um, at and, least for me. Yeah, and I think it's it's also leaning into something that I, I'm starting to see trend a bit more often where the general contractors are starting to self-perform more work now. And so if you're adopting a lot of robotics and different technologies, it, it starts to make sense to build out your crew because you say, okay, we, we have five of these or 10 of these that we're going to deploy on site. And we want to have a consistent group of people who know how to use that technology. So it gives that talent confidence that they're going to continue to have work, but it also gives you more certainty in your schedules and all of the the challenges that we're dealing with right now. And so I think it it changes the the approach for some of the general contractors. And it's, it's always just neat to see having so many people on staff who like they're a skilled tradesman, like they're a carpenter or whatever. And now it's like, are you a robotics guy? You know, it's it it opens new avenues, you know, whatever type of organization they're actually working for. It does. And certainly in those two examples with uh, the robotic uh, pilots on site. Um, it also opened up, you know, the realization that we need to make sure that we're all trusting each other. Yeah. Um, cause we certainly wanted to make sure that we were a good host for not only canvas and dusty, but also for Neville group. Cause you know, if the robot like breaks down or needs to recharge or, you know, just something happens and needs to get, um, kind of fixed or troubleshot, we need to make sure that we weren't going to immediately penalize them. Yeah. It's like, Oh, you're late. You're delayed. So I think all of us just having that, you know, understanding and like you said, that shared long-term vision is so important. Um, so that way we can promote the next pilot and then the next pilot and the pilot after that. Yeah. And in communicating that it's a safe space to have those things happen as well, yep. because that fear, that's huge. You go, oh gosh, this, this happened and now I'm responsible. But if you've let people know, it's like, we're trying this, this is new. There's a bit of leeway here. We've, we've given you a safe space to do this. We've, we've accounted for that as well. That gives people a lot more freedom to, you know, try things and, you know, break stuff sometimes it happens, yeah. you know? You mentioned augmented reality or AR a couple of minutes ago, and I wanted to come back to that specifically within the realm of data. And, and I'm a data nerd. I love talking about data because there's, there's a lot of value as our technologies start to become more integrated and people start asking more questions about what can be done with that or what, what is possible instead of just capturing it just to capture, which we, we did for a yeah. while as well. It's like this massive lake of data that doesn't necessarily have any action or outcome from it. But I'd love to hear a bit more about how you're managing ER out in the field, but specifically the incredibly increasing volume of data that cr is created with augmented reality or reality capture or any of these tools and technologies. Yeah, I mean, the job site today looks way different. And what used to be the red line set in the trailer, you know, half size or full size sheets with the RFIs either taped to the back or in the binder, you know, that was data, that was current. And now there's so much metadata tied to everything. And I mean, I think it is important. I mean, structuring the data from the beginning, like having a really solid BIM implementation plan, you know, in job site startup, I think is something that some of the customers overlook. Um, that while they might address it and kind of check the box, really having those, you know, roll up your sleeves and figure out again, how are we going to do this and why? Yeah. And, and what do you want from the data as well? Exactly. There's, there's an education part of the, the owner contractor relationship that I'm hearing about more and more where it's uh, help me empower you 
and have that conversation you're alluding to where you might be able to create a digital twin if you really get into it or this more advanced technology. Not everybody is you know, interested in going that deep, but it's much harder to go that deep if you've already started construction and somebody mentions that versus it being part of the iterative process at the very beginning. Yeah, and even something as simple as you know naming conventions for when you start to specify fixtures. Everything should be different, all different. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, it comes back to that. So... You know, once everything is in the federated model and you do start to run exports through like assemble or whatever, you then have just like more true, like at its core structured information that you can actually start to like run analytics on. Because if you have to pay someone, you know, I don't know, like 40 hours to organize the information, you're so far behind. And again, going back to AR, if we are paying all of these, you know, like again, subject matter experts to enrich the federated model, why do we need to then pay someone to translate that out in the field? Like that shouldn't be a burden that we pass on. It yeah. should be, like you said, a privilege. Hey, we've done all of the legwork. Here you go. Here's your path to success. And again, for us specifically, you know, with Hensel Phelps, we don't have like our own AR team. But I think what we're trying to do is find an easier way to deploy that. And, you know, again, an early player in that was certainly Microsoft and HoloLens. Mm -hmm. um, you know, game changing as far as like, you know, what you could see and um, again, broadcast. But now with the hardware that you can buy commercially, you know, again, an iPad Pro or an iPhone 14. And it's so much less expensive than it, it was is. and powerful for that yeah. price point. So like, you know, some of these like, again, mobile devices have, you know, LIDAR that is as good, if not better than what you need. And what we're finding is uh, for like QAQC, it's more of like that binary pass. Mm -hmm. So, you know, working with some early stage startups, they're like, okay, well, if you're going to be laying this out, you need it to a 16th. And while that is true for layout and a lot of these AR like workflows, what we're trying to get to aspirationally is, you know, let me just kind of like scan the room or scan the concrete slab, whatever it is before the placement. Are we missing an embed? Are we missing the sleeves? Um, are things relatively in the same location? And what you're finding is, you know, the computer vision learning only has to spike to within six inches. And if it's more or less than six inches out, color it red. Yeah. And then allow, like you said, those experts, like the drawing sets, to like go back and be like, hey, project team, we need to look at these three locations versus paying someone to count the you know, number of rebar or like, you know, I like just measure all the space and like, I mean, certainly that still happens, but is there a way that we can quickly enhance the, you know, the depth of inspection to make sure, to your point, the end user, the client's getting the right thing. We're avoiding rework. And again, we're bringing the most current information to the field as easy as we can. So that's what I'm hopeful yeah. uh, we'll see more in 2023 is, again, you know, person, you know, like mobile devices, um, you know, again, being able to act as that gateway uh, to the trades for this, you know, like really enrich data set. It makes sense. And in the, the standardization that you're alluding to is also a big part of it, too. And, you know, I joke like everything must be different. <laughs> but there's there's a middle point there, of course. You don't want to be too prescriptive because it's burdensome for your teams then. But having common naming conventions and a bit more standardization there makes that data easier to analyze and then also hand over to somebody else because they're not going, why is this room like this, but this one's different and it's all named differently. And it also gives you parity when you go and look project to project to, at your organization too, because you get to start inferring, okay, how did this go? Is there consistency? And every single one is different. It's really hard to actually have a meaningful conversation. But I just, I love hearing about the, the smarter, more informed owners who are really thinking about what they want because that life cycle of the building, that's what the cost is. It's, you, this building's going to operate for 60, 80, 100 years and to eliminate uncertainty of what's you know been built or make it easier to capture that data or even just say what kind of light bulbs are in building seven because Sean said the one four bulbs over is out. You don't have a guy up on a ladder going, okay, well, what light bulb is that? Uh, you just You just know. And yeah, there's a lot of opportunity there, too. You have to keep up to it. It's not something that just you finish, you go, we have a digital twin, and you walk it away. But it, it has value long term that I think more and more people are starting to see are is meaningful and a lot more accessible than they might have accept or understood in the past. True. And then also going back to you know that modeling environment, you know, we are starting to 
I'll say maybe like appreciate a lot of the workflows and lessons learned from the prefab industry to start to figure out again, how can we rule check the model or you know, the elements before production? And it could be something as simple as like, you know, hey, if we make this one tweak, all of these panels now can be standardized. Mm-hmm. And then we can allow the architecture team to figure out, okay, what are these like, you know, few areas that we really want to enhance and make special? Um, but behind the scene, 90, 80% of it is you know, able to get unitized or kitted. And you don't have these areas where it has to be so like, you know, one off or niche that it slows the production team down. It promotes more opportunity for error or you know, nonconformance. Especially with like serial builders or hospitals or things where there's, oh, especially there's a consistency where it's like this has to be this way. Yep. Not having a kit of a parts approach so doesn't make very much sense if, if you're going to be a serial builder or doing this thing often. And one thing I, I really like is starting to be dispelled more often now is there's this perception that prefab is just this ugly square box and you're going to stand it up. Like you can make prefab pretty sexy for lack of a better framing because the technology has gotten so good and the capabilities in what we're doing are just so much more advanced than they were 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. So it's not, we're going to put in our cabinets and our casework and prefab because we have to meet some small percentage requirement for our contract. It's how can we make this building safer to put up, easier to put up, repeatable at scale, but also just have that confidence and certainty. Because if you built most of it in a factory and then you just stood it up, you're going to know where all your stuff is. There's, yeah. there's no surprises. It's not stick built from scratch or anything it's it's a very different conversation so yeah and like you were mentioning before eric with you know that you know life cycle management if you can again smartly design the building where you know in attic stock the owner now has to maintain let's say 28 different types of light fixtures versus 280 (laughs) it's a fair point exactly all of a sudden it's like okay that's that's easier you know they don't have to learn all these different you know lighting control modules or drivers it's this system yeah and Again, staying in that same vein, there's still a ton of opportunity to, you know, celebrate the space, make it personalized, make it feel like it's, you know, unique and welcoming without, like you were saying in prefab, like this ugly stereotype of, oh, it's plain, it's generic, it's boring, it's all square. Yeah, that's just not not simply not true anymore. I mean, it does happen, and, and some applications are appropriate for that. You're trying to build something quickly and simple and inexpensive, or some variation of all of those factors. And yeah, build your thing that's straightforward and easy. You put it up, you move on to the next one. But it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. So I'm, I'm and I'm I'm actually quite excited about it. Um, so I. I could nerd about this with you for another hour or two, but I know we have to (laughs) start wrapping it up so you can get back to your projects. So I have a couple more questions for you. Um, One is a question I ask every guest here, and it's it's one of my favorites because it's interesting to see where, you know, your focus is with uh, technology and tools. But what is one tool that you will always bring to every project that you work on? Yeah, so, so for some of the viewers, this might sound like, you know, like cliche or like, you know, like taboo. But as a technology lover, like, you know, someone that truly appreciates technology, at my core, I definitely need to bring a pen and a notebook to every single meeting. Uh, I'm definitely listening. I'm definitely like engaged. Um, We'll bring innovative workflows, but there's just something satisfying about writing it down, you know, having it, you know, turn the page, crossing it off, that tactile, uh, you know, note taking for me is a must. It makes sense. And for me, to-do lists are almost always on paper. I, I've tried to digi- di- digitize, I stumble over that word all the time. I, I've tried to use digital tools for my, my to-do list, just like personal stuff before. And I'll have middling results on it. There is something so satisfying wow. of I've finished the thing and now I'm going to put a big Sharpie line through the thing yep. and I can go, that is done. It's like it's got a nice productivity f- feel to it. So I I, yeah. I, uh, I definitely agree. While we're, we're trending digital as much as we can, there still is definitely a place for having something that is just, you know, in front of you that you can touch. But yep. I'm hopeful that the days of big giant blueprints spread all of our project sites are uh, the days of yesterday and not uh, the future. <laughs> yeah, we're definitely not still uh, using the analog uh, drawing approach. But uh, yeah, in the meetings, the uh, the technology guy is you know the one set up with the, uh, the pen and paper. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So is there anything that you're working on right now or excited that you'd like to plug today? Um, I wouldn't say like anything specific for me, but um, as far as like Hensel Phelps and again, what we're trying to do in the industry, you know, similar to what we mentioned before, is really, you know, champion and celebrate being a steward. Yeah. And trying to help grow and promote where we can. 
Uh, certainly, again, we have all different kinds of projects. We operate in different kinds of regions. Um, but again, at its core, you know, like a project team, you know, I truly think that the individuals, the team members that we have are great. And to continue to give them the opportunity to challenge the status quo, um, find more efficient, you know, like workflows, nuances, tools, that gets me really excited. So as we start 2023, um, what I'm optimistic for is that, you know, our project teams, either here in Northern California or around the country, you know, are able to further deploy or just advance what we know or what we're confident with AR, what we're confident with, you know, maybe some pre-construction software solutions and really set ourselves up to, you know, take a bigger leap into 2024 than we were from 22 to 23. Yeah, I think there's a lot of room for innovation. And, you know, personally, I appreciate your role as a steward and having those conversations because we need people like you and we need people like your peers to help make sure that what's happening at the technology companies and industries that are adjacent to it does map back to the needs of the companies that we're supporting and then the, the customers that they're building for. So it's, it's a big ecosystem. And if everybody's not playing somewhat of a part in those conversations, it's easy to miss on occasion. So thank you very much for, you know, being committed to that and just finding it interesting and impactful. It, it has a, a big value for uh, you know companies like Autodesk and many others. So. Yeah, thank you. Well, everybody out there listening, thank you for taking the time to join us on this episode of Autodesk Digital Builder Podcast. If you've got any questions or want to suggest a guest for a future episode, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn or find me on Twitter via builder underscore digital. Also, we are on YouTube right now, so I am with Andrew in the Autodesk gallery. So if you want to see what this absolutely beautiful space looks like or just uh, see the weird faces that I make during these conversations, make sure you check us out over on uh, the Autodesk Construction Cloud channel. And then finally, if you're enjoying the show, please rate us on Apple Podcasts or your favorite player. All you got to do is open the app. Uh, give us five stars if you feel we uh, you know, deserve it. It does do a big, uh, a big impact for us on the, uh, the back end. And on that final note, goodbye. <laughs>